Hi, everybody. Hopefully everybody's week has gone well. Uh, it's almost damn time. So we're going to finish up the applied security seminar today with talking about post exploitation and lateral movement. Uh, before we get started, make sure you sign in at the Google link at the bottom. It's also in Slack, so you should be able to do that. A uh, couple administrative things before we get started. Tomorrow starts the Gray Hat CTF. Uh, it's being put on by the applied team, Gavin and myself. So it's going to start tomorrow at noon. Uh, it's going to be a VPN CTF. So you're going to go connect to a VPN and you'll have full, uh, you'll have a scope that you can go attack inside this VPN network. And that's going to let you go do in-map scans and really kind of get to play with all the different stuff and put it all together that we've talked about this semester. Uh, there'll be a prize for whoever has the most points at Monday, next Monday at 6.30. Uh, and then we'll have a blue jeans meeting right back here. There'll be a link in Slack so that we can talk about some of the problems. So that'll be really fun. Uh, that'll start to start up tomorrow. So today we're finally going to leave our unit on exploitation. And we're going to start talking about post-exploitation. And that's going to let us further generalize a lot of the things that we've been talking about with exploitation and just attacking and the whole penetration testing mindset as a whole. So now that we've gotten into a system, we're going to ask ourselves what we can do now. Sometimes we'll have more trust for the, from the network, and we'll also be able to go straight up exfiltrate some data. So we've got in. Now we're able to start our post-exploitation. The big theme here that we're going to be talking about is going to be trust. So when we have a higher level of trust from the network and from the system network administrators, whether that be intentionally or unintentionally because some security control wasn't thought of, it's going to mean that we're, we have an elevated amount of access. Uh, there's two types of post-exploitation that we're going to get into. You can do post-exploitation, exploit, you can do local post-exploitation so you can do things like start exfiltrating data from a database that's hosted on this machine. You can go try to get root access with a privilege escalation exploit, or you can go from the web service that you just hacked into using command injection all the way over to an email service that might be on the same machine. When we talk about network post exploitation, what we're really talking about is lateral movement. And that's saying that we've compromised this one system and we've owned it. And now we're going to go from this system to another system in the network. And what's going to happen in general when you're doing this is you're going to try to maximize some value. Maybe your pen test is for seeing how much uh, user private uh, personal user information you can obtain, how many credit cards, social security numbers you can get out of the database. And that's going to tell you that you should go attack some other systems in the accounting area or maybe in the cloud storage area, or maybe your goal is to go compromise on the employee machines. So we'd probably want to go for the Active Directory stuff. We're going to talk about how to kind of generalize where you want to go in your network post-exploitation in a minute. So to return to something that we looked at last week, but to talk about it in more depth, is that now that we've gotten into a system, we're able to go exploit our promoted access. We're in a new state uh, in the context of our network. So in this example here, you have the corporate network with an e-commerce site that's facing out to the world. And that has SSH open to everyone on port 22. It has HTTPS, a web server on port 443. And then it has that private port that only people who are inside the network can get to on port 8080. Uh, the other interesting thing here is that there's a Mongo database that's only listening on an internal network address. It's listening on 10.2.1.121, which is not even a real, it's a reserved IP address uh, when you're looking at it in the public network. So you'll never be able to get to it from the public network. But if we're able to go exploit that web server on port 443, we're able to go pivot off of the e-commerce site and we're able to go uh, do post-exploitation steps to go get some data from the e-commerce site, but then also go break into this database server that's living somewhere else on this network. So post-exploitation steps, just to kind of give an overview of a couple things that we can do and to think about when you're thinking about post-exploitation. 
The first one is going to be data exfiltration. If you've achieved your goal, if you've found the employee credentials, if you've compromised the database, you might just want to go dump everything out of there. Um, and a lot of breaches that you might hear about, you'll see that many gigabytes of data got exfiltrated from the network. And usually it's encrypted, so you can't see exactly what's getting exfiltrated. An attacker can just nuke all the logs when they're done if you don't have proper, um, if, you're, if you're not auditing your stuff properly. Uh, I heard about this one attack where they exfiltrated multiple terabytes of data, but it wound up just being this like crap data that didn't mean anything. And it was all a red herring while they actually went and got further into the network. Uh, another thing you can do is you can go put malware onto the machine that you just uh, exploited. That can be key loggers. So you can kind of covertly see what the employee is doing on the machine. Maybe you can steal more credentials that way. Or you can go install ransomware if, you're, if your only goal is to go get money. You can just go, go encrypt all their files and say, you have to send me $500 in Bitcoin to go get all your files decrypted. Another thing you can do is you can do privilege escalation. Uh, that's really privilege escalation is where binary exploitation is mostly used. Because generally, when you first get into a network, at least when you're looking at a corporate network, you're going to probably do a web attack. Maybe sometimes you'll be able to go throw a Metasploit exploit at some service that hasn't been updated. But when you start looking at actual kernels and operating systems and other low-level services, uh, you'll be able to start exploiting binaries. Uh, I, recently, there was a binary exploitation vulnerability in the sudo command that I'm not sure if there was ever a proof of concept to go do this, but in theory, you could have gone and escalated your privileges to root just by exploiting the sudo command. So you open yourself up to a whole lot more exploits that you can even run just on that machine with your post-exploitation. Uh, another thing that you can do is lateral movement. And you can basically, with lateral movement, you go and escalate your privileges in the context not of just the machine that you're already on, but the whole network. Uh, another thing that's really fun is you can get really, you can get back into that social engineering mindset once you've exploited a machine. If you've exploited an employee's Mac, you can now hijack their Slack sessions and you can do this thing called internal spear phishing. Spear phishing is like phishing, uh, sending emails to try to elicit information from your target. But spear phishing means that it's targeted. So rather than going and sending a million people this email saying that to go reset your password, now you're going and saying, hello, Mr. Adams, uh, I need your password to go and fix something. And if that's coming from an IT person inside the company, you're a whole lot more likely to land that attack, especially if it's coming from somewhere that's trusted like Slack or an internal email account. So those are a couple of things you can do with post-exploitation and why I think it's the most important part of a penetration test. Uh, are there any questions on that so far? Cool, if they come up in blue jeans, I'm happy to answer them. So the first tool that we are going to talk about with post-exploitation, and it's going to make a lot more sense when we start talking about lateral movement, is Mimikatz. So this is the textbook post-exploitation tool. It's mostly for Windows machines, and it lets you do Windows password cracking pretty easily. Windows is super complex. Last week, we talked about how Windows has millions of lines of code, and on average, there's a security vulnerability in every 10,000 lines of code. And one of the things that Windows does to make users' lives easier is that they store your password in memory. So Mimikatz is able to go grab that password out of memory. And what's really interesting about that is that when your password is in memory, it's probably not, it doesn't have the same rigorous encryption that it has when it's stored onto your disk because it requires uh, more access in order to go access the it requires more access privileges in order to go grab that password. Uh, Mimikatz also does a lot of cool stuff for Active Directory. Uh, there are also a lot of exploits for privilege escalation on Linux machines. It's a little bit trickier to go do it on a Linux machine. Generally, updating your operating system is going to solve those uh, privilege escalation issues, but 
when you go and look at the list of CVEs and the list of all of these different vulnerabilities that happened, most of them are for actual programs. Uh, there was one recently that Steam allowed privilege escalation because on Windows machines, Steam was running as an admin. So even if someone who was not an admin was running, had access to the Steam files, they could go pivot off of Steam and run whatever commands they wanted to as an admin. And Steam was like, well, anyone who's running this is probably not going to have any outward facing services on their machine. So it's probably not too bad that we have this problem. So it's not a priority. So a really cool thing that Mimicats can do back to Windows is that it also works for Active Directory. So what is Active Directory? Active Directory is a huge monolithic piece of technology that allows you to go essentially run a corporate network and it handles all the systems, the users, and the groups that you might need in a corporate network. Your Active Directory instance can get really complicated really quickly because you're not only having to care about each individual system in Active Directory, you also have to care about how each system interacts with, or each entity to, uh, which is the term that Active Directory uses, interacts with all the other entities in Active Directory. So if you look at that like a graph, you wind up with a quadratic number of relations between all of the different entities in your Active Directory instance. And that's a whole lot more difficult to deal with than just the individual entities. So a couple things you can do with Active Directory are you can create users. Uh, that's kind of why how when you log into a Georgia Tech computer with your username and password, it just works. And you're able to do it with, like with a, the same password, regardless of whether you've made an account on that computer or not. Uh, you can also go set permissions for systems and set permissions for users and set permissions for groups that allow people to do certain things. On Windows computers, you might say that uh, IT is allowed to, if you have one of those computers that are in the lecture halls that let you go do the PowerPoints, you might say students can do PowerPoints and they can open web browsers, but IT people can go open up the local security policy and start changing local passwords around. And you can also add in a local admin user that's only admin on that lecture machine that can do whatever they want on there, on that machine. Uh, you can also go say like, I want the HR department in this region to be able to do these things and access these files and access these file shares while the, the accounting department can't touch any of it. You can also control file shares with Active Directory. So how do we talk to Active Directory? So the traditional way of grabbing files and getting information about things in the directory and just seeing what is there, maybe you have an email client that needs to go resolve emails when you go type in somebody's name. Uh, the language that gets used for that is called LDAP. Uh, LDAP can be used for authentication, but we're going to talk about what people use in the modern Active Directory usage called Kerberos in a second. Uh, LDAP, whenever you hear about LDAP being used in a web application, you should immediately think of SQL injection because LDAP, just like SQL and just like shell commands, wind up getting used as a string or getting passed as a string. So if I'm a developer and I've created this LDAP resolver in my email that just goes and concatenates whatever the user inputs with the LDAP query around it, then that'll be grounds for injection because I'll be able to go put whatever I want as the user's name and I'll be able to escape out of the query and I can go start making arbitrary code in my LDAP command. So, and one of the big reasons that you use Kerberos is to prevent this. Uh, the other reason that you use Kerberos is because it avoids actually sending passwords over the wire. So Kerberos is a technology that gets used for authentication. And the way that that works is at a very simple level, because it's a super complicated thing that I don't really understand as a whole. But when you have a Kerberos, you go ask the domain controller which is, if you look at Active Directory uh, and the structure of it like a tree, this is an important point actually, 
the domain, this pyramid at the top here is called our domain controller. And that's like the, the keys to the kingdom. If you've broken into a domain controller, you own the entire network. Why is that? Because the domain controller is allowed to go create policy for all of these entities. If you wanted to, if you had access to the domain controller, you could just delete the entire network. Or you could just go give all users all permissions for all things and really cause some problems. That also means that if you're managing a domain controller, then you have a lot of, uh, it's really easy to mess everything up. So it's interesting how you have this kind of tree structure here with the domain at the top. But so when you use Kerberos, your endpoint, your leaf in this Active Directory tree is talking to the root. It's talking to the domain controller and it's saying, hey, can I have a session? I, I want to go create an Active Directory session because I want to go log into this computer. I want to go uh, see some files in the file, file share. I want to go log into this web server. So Active Directory gives you a, an amount of data and then it gives you a certificate basically. And then using your password on the Windows machine or whatever machine, you can go take your password, you encrypt it, and then you sign it with the whatever Active Directory just gave you. And then you have what's called a ticket. And that ticket is going to be authenticated with the domain controller and will allow you to go talk to different things on the network. The big uh, security thing that you're solving there is that now you're not ever passing clear text passwords along this network. You're just passing these ephemeral, these temporary keys. So the logic issue with that from a security, ex, uh, from a security standpoint is that when you're passing around an encrypted password as your password, then that really becomes your password. Uh, even though it's a temporary password, it still can get used. And that's what Mimikatz is able to go read out of memory at the end of the day. It's able to go read out these temporary passwords that you can now go use on other machines. When you go and you steal the password, when you go and steal the temporary password, that's still all good with the Kerberos instance on the domain controller. You're able to really go now talk to other servers. So if I'm someone in IT, and I just got my computer breached, then I, someone can go steal all my uh, NTLM hashes from memory, and now I can go talk to maybe the HR machines in that Georgia Tech example from a few minutes ago. Now I can have full access to all of these lecture endpoints, and I can do that over the network because now I have the hash of the password, which is what's getting sent around on the network. This attack is a really... Uh, important attack when you're looking at lateral movement. It's called passing the hash. So when you're passing the hash, you're exploiting trust that other systems give you. So if the lecture, if the lecture machines trust IT to, do, to log into them remotely, now if I've exploited the IT person's personal computer, I can go and connect to the lecture machines. So you can do a similar thing with passing the ticket. Uh, this is a little bit less powerful than passing the hash, but when you pass the ticket, you're passing the actual session ticket that Kerberos has created with you. Are there any questions on passing the hash, on passing the ticket? It's kind of a like pretty like nebulous concept for most people since it's something that you don't really think about too much. Um, NTLM hashes, just like MD5 hashes and SHA-256 hashes, are susceptible to rainbow table attacks, which is when you have a really big list of NTLM hashes and then their strings that are, or the actual clear text password associated with it. So you can just go look it all up in a, like a hash map and you can see what the password is. So there are websites where you can go type in an NTLM hash, and if they've considered it before, maybe they tried to go brute force all of them, maybe they tried to, maybe they just used a dictionary attack, maybe they even added the number one after it, because now they're storing in a database, they can do as much as they want. You can just go look it up really quickly. So another important tool to talk about when you're talking about lateral movement is PowerShell Empire. 
this goes in, this is just a term that you'll hear thrown around a lot when you're talking about post exploitation, but it allows for secure communication. So it's encrypted. So the security department can't see what you're doing. Um, and then you can also go use key loggers, Mimikatz, and more. It's all bundled in there. And it's also installed on Kali for you. The big issue with it is that it's not very covert. So when you're looking at uh, when you're looking at security from a blue team perspective, it's really easy to go audit or even just turn off PowerShell scripts. And you really can only do so much with encrypting PowerShell scripts because at the end of the day, you have to still be able to go reverse it and interpret it. So it's not the best tool. There are tools nowadays that are written in C Sharp that get around all this. Uh, one of them is called Covenant. I can send a link to that later if someone asks. And uh, they're, but the cool thing about all these tools is that they're modular, just like Metasploit. Uh, Metasploit actually has some post exploitation tools in it as well. But usually when you're doing post X, you want to go use something that's just for post X. Uh, there was a question in chat, if you can get the hash by just sniffing the network traffic. Um, I'm not totally sure. I think that there is some sort of encryption. Actually, yeah, I don't think you can because one of the things that Kerberos is doing is it's encrypting it. So you have like over the network, that's what the certificate is doing and the ticket. So if you were able to go intercept the ticket, you might be able to do something, but generally you'll have to have access to the computer in order to go get the hash. So I'll have to get back to you on this, but I think passing the ticket, you would be able to go do with a network sniffing attack, but passing the hash, you would have to be on the physical machine. Uh, so another really cool tool for Active Directory is we talked about this passing the hash and this passing the ticket, but we also talked about how complex Active Directory graphs can get. So Bloodhound is a tool that will go start at a certain point in Active Directory. It'll go figure out all the little logic issues in your Active Directory instance. And the ultimate goal in Bloodhound is to get to the domain controller. So I want to give you all a demo of Bloodhound. So let me get that set up now. So we'll open up Kali here. Open up Bloodhound. So I've gone and downloaded a sample Bloodhound uh, thing from the internet, a simple uh, sample Bloodhound graph from the internet. But there is also a script in Bloodhound that you it uses PowerShell, and you can go write it. You can go run it rather on a uh, compromised machine. And then generally you can go read a lot of things about a Active Directory instance. You just might not be able to write to them as a default permission. And also there are a lot of read actions going on in general. So you should be able to go covertly read all this information off. So this is Bloodhound. It's a very clunky program inside my VM here. But you have a couple of queries. You can write your own queries as well. But let's, we're going to try to find the shortest path to the domain admin. And we're going to go look at the Japan domain admin. Oops. So in this example, uh, Japan is the domain controller. And there are some subgroups on here, Tokyo and I think there was one more. There was uh, so Active Directory stores the groups and the subdirectories as subdomains. So you see Japan.local is the domain, and Tokyo.Japan.local consists of the or is the group here. And then anything at that is a user or a group within an MDE directory. So if we're 
So we can start over here at a user. We're always going to start at a user in Active Directory as one as a leaf. And we see that there is a user here that we can assume that we compromised for this example. We'll use this one. It's a SQL server. So maybe we got into a web server and now we're able to go get into this whole SQL server. We see that the SQL user is an admin on this machine called Jade. And this user over here, who we could say is a person in IT who is a domain admin, has a session that they've created on the machine that's hosting the database. So we've compromised the database machine, and now we're able to go pivot off of this user who we can now, maybe we were able to go read their hash off from memory. We're able to go pivot because they're a member of the domain admin group. And I've lost the, lost my place. So they're a member of the domain admin group. So then they're able to go get into this uh, generic session right here, uh, which is, oh, so the, the domain admin here that we were able to go compromise is in the domain admin group, but only in the Tokyo domain admin group. So we're able to go pivot again to this RPAN A person, and they're a member of the machine admin group for the entirety of Japan. So because now we're in this group, who's an admin on the Callisto machine, which could just be an endpoint, we were able to go pivot from the database machine using some pass the hash or pass the ticket attack to now pivot onto this machine. So we now find another user, uh, Agwanda, who has had a session on the new machine, the second machine that we've compromised, which is a Windows Server box. And this user that we were able to go steal session is a member of the domain admin group. So now we've gotten ourselves domain admin on the entirety of this Active Directory network. So now that we have domain admin, we can do something called a golden ticket attack, where we can go create a universal Kerberos ticket that lets us go hop onto any machine that we want on the entire network. And we're also allowed to go create policy. So that's the wrong one. Um, so that's how Bloodhound works. So, and that's also, that's how generally in a penetration test, that's the methodology is you're going to go get into a public facing server, maybe a web server, and then you're going to go pivot off of that. And ultimately, if your goal is to just compromise the whole network, you're going to go for the domain controller. Uh, a lot of the time when people in, uh, so a lot of 21st century machines go use AWS or other cloud computing things. A lot of the time those are uh, independent from Active Directory because people know that this can happen. So the authentication still gets done by Active Directory, but there's a whole nother set of rules and access controls when you're talking about cloud computing uh, things like AWS. Those use these things called IAM rules, IAM, to go basically do a similar uh, thing where you're limiting trust for users. Um, that would have been an interesting thing to talk about. Actually, that sound, that's a good uh, gray hat talk that someone could do on uh, AWS security. Because that's a whole other ballgame. So that's all I have in terms of tools for post-exploitation. But there's a couple of uh, abstractions and things that I want to talk about to kind of wrap up what we've been doing. So the main things that we talked about in the themes were vulnerabilities, services, and systems. So the vulnerabilities can lead to increased access and increased trust within our services and systems. So if we kind of think about this in a different way, we can think about vulnerabilities as edges between two states. We had a state in which we were not admin on a machine, and then we were able to go exploit a vulnerability that gave us root, and now we're in a new state where we're root on this machine. 
And now from this root, maybe we can go exploit MS0867 and go pivot over to a state in which we're in, we have access to another machine. So the cool thing that you can now create, if you think about it like this, and you think about it with states, is you can create this thing called an attack graph. So attack graphs are directed in acyclic graphs where every time you follow an edge, you have increased you have an increased amount of access to something. You're, you're never going to go backwards in an attack graph. And the cool thing, and so the edges are vulnerabilities, and the vertex, the vertices are different states that you have as an attacker. So in this attack graph, we have a source at the default state where we have no access to anything in the web server. And we branch off and exploit, exploit two different vulnerabilities to go get read access to the database and also shell access to the web server. And this is where that recursive thing comes in with the vulnerabilities because now we have access to the, we have increased access to the web server. So we're inside the firewall and we can go pivot and get to other vert vertices. Our fringe has been increased because we have access to more, we can go talk to more things. So why do we care about attack graphs? So one thing you can do with an attack graph, and I think this is the coolest thing ever. So when you have a vulnerability that creates an edge, you can then actually go assign impact to each of these different states. So the most important one here is say the domain controller has an impact of 100. We really don't want that domain controller to get breached, but also, Compared to having shell access on the web server, maybe we don't care about it too much, so root is only 10. Maybe reading from the database is only 10 too, but reading from Salesforce, which is a way to go manage uh, sales for a company, and they have an API so that your web services can go talk to Salesforce, that's gonna have a lot of customer information in it, so we're gonna weight that as 60. So now we can create this recursive definition of impact of how bad a vulnerability is. So I calculated the impacts here. So it looks like the, the impact of this pass the hash vulnerability that gives you access to the domain controller is 100. But this impact and the cost of a vulnerability not getting fixed compounds as you get closer to the source of your tree, of your, of your directed acyclic graph. So what ends up happening is that we can actually say that this command injection vulnerability is the worst vulnerability here. And it's the one that needs to get patched first if we're a security team, because the command injection vulnerability opens up this entire space that we can go exploit these other vulnerabilities. So, you can also uh, get a little more complicated with how you can prioritize which vulnerabilities to fix by factoring in what's called the CVSS score of a vulnerability. Uh, whenever there's a new CVE that comes out, whenever there's a new vulnerability that is submitted to the National Vulnerability Database, it's also assigned a CVSS score. And the CVSS score is dependent on how bad the vulnerability is uh, how hard it is to exploit, and how widespread it is. So we can actually now weight the edges in this graph, and we can try to maximize the impact that we have on our network paired up with the severity of the vulnerability that the CVSS score gives us. And then we have a much more interesting way that we can analyze the vulnerabilities and prioritize which ones we fix first. You could also weight your edges based on time and how long it would take a vulnerability to fix. And you can go figure out which uh, vulnerabilities your team should fix first based on the amount of time uh, compared to the risk factor or the cost of not fixing it. So, Another thing that I, uh, that I, when I was researching this, I saw is that people will go and basically create these graphs that just assume that vulnerabilities do exist. And then they go calculate the probability of a transition. And when
when you, you wind up with a transition matrix like that, you can actually run a Markov chain on it and you can see where you need to go focus your efforts uh, in terms of probability to like go see if there are vulnerabilities there. Interesting thing that smart people have figured out on the internet. Uh, so these are some additional resources for practicing this post-exploitation stuff. Hack the Box is still a really good resource. Um, a lot of the Hack the Box machines are linear in that you have to go maybe exploit a web service first. And then once you've exploited that web service, you're able to go do more and you're able to get into higher states on each machine. Uh, and you maybe, and usually the exploits also get more complicated as you keep working through the hack the box instance. So I think that's a really cool thing you can do. Um, other than that, unless there are any other questions, that's all I've got. Um, any questions on post exploitation? I'll stick around for a couple minutes. I'm going to stop recording though.